has equipped us and allowed us to do this. It's been some 15 years now that I've been involved with this ministry, and uh, so we're on board. This is what we believe God's called us to do in life. We're not looking for anything else. We're not looking for the next best thing. This is it. This is what God's called us to do, and only he, if he wants to change the plan, I give him, certainly he can do that, but we believe it's God's will, and, uh, and so uh, we hope that you will pray for Help Ministries. I want to say thanks to uh, Brother Stagner for spending quite a number of hours bringing me up here today. He's quite a busy man. I understand uh, what it's like to take time out of your schedule. So, but BJ, I want to uh, just publicly thank you for that. Preacher, thank you for allowing me to come in and stand behind this pulpit. I, I, I take it uh, as a great privilege and I count it as a great privilege and I understand the responsibility. Uh, the, your preacher was joking with me a little bit when we come into, when we have conferences in the States, we have maybe eight or ten guys, and sometimes we'll be at a church one night, and uh, you may have three, four guys giving their testimony. And uh, uh, Americans are expected to have a, you know, a service that lasts a, a, a standard amount of time, and so sometimes they get three minutes to give a testimony or five minutes to preach. And so Simon turned the tables on me tonight and says, all right, brother, you got five minutes to preach and two minutes to give your testimony. But I see that there's no clock here, so I'm going to be okay because... You say, well, what does the clock mean for a Baptist preacher? Not much at all, but it does help to know what time it is. But I do have my phone here. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm, Psalm, to Acts 16. Excuse me, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter number 16. And verse number 22. Acts 16 and verse 22. I'm going to begin reading and you'll... Find me in just a moment if you're not there already. Acts 16 and verse 22. The Bible says, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. And sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Let's pray. Father, we ask for your help tonight. Lord, I pray that you would encourage our hearts through your word. I do thank you, Father, for this great privilege and opportunity to stand behind this sacred desk and proclaim spiritual truth. I will ask for your help. Lord, I can only address the ear tonight, and I'll rely upon the Holy Spirit of God to speak to the hearts. Lord, we thank you for giving us this great and wonderful opportunity. And we pray that your name will be lifted up and glorified and that everything that's said will be pleasing in thy sight and in accordance with thy word. Lord, we thank you now for Brother B.J. bringing me all the way over here this afternoon. Pray you bless him, his family, his ministry. Be with the ministry here, Brother Simon and his family. Lord, we thank you for him and we pray for him and lift him before you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to share a story. I understand I'll run the risk that it's not funny here. And a lot of times I run the risk, no matter where I tell the story, it's not funny. But I'm going to try it anyway, okay? There's two guys who were great friends, uh, Jim and John. And, and Jim, uh, he, you know, he was a pretty smart guy, but John was not so smart. He, he kind of just really uh, followed in the footsteps and in the shadow of Jim. They decided that they wanted to get a job together driving a truck. And, uh, and so Jim said, I believe I'm going to go down and try to get a job driving a truck. And John's like, well, I'd like to go with you. Can I go with you? And sure. So they're, they're being interviewed, and the guy senses that, you know, Jim's answering all the questions. He says, now, wait a minute. He said, Jim, I want you to be quiet for a second. I've got some questions, and I only want John to answer. John said, all right, I believe I can answer. He said, now, John, he said, now, now how many days of the week start with T? And John thought about that for a second. He said, well, okay, there's two. He said, today and tomorrow. Now he said, now wait a minute. He said, that, that is not exactly right. He said, that ain't exactly wrong. He said, but it ain't exactly right. He says, now how many seconds are there in a year? And boy, old John thought about that. He said, man, that, this, is, this is tough. And he, I got it. There's 12 seconds in a year. 12 seconds in a year. Yes, the 2nd of January, the 2nd of February. <laughs> no, no, he said, that is not it. He said, that ain't right. But, you know, really, it ain't exactly wrong. He said, I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to put you in a hypothetical situation. Now, imagine, and remember now, Jim, you can't say anything. John, you're driving the truck. You're driving the truck, and Jim is asleep. 
Now, Jim cannot help you. You can't ask him a question about anything because you're not going to have time to ask Jim any question. Here's the scenario. You're in a truck going down a hill. It is loaded full of gravel. You, you, you're, going, you, you're going to lose your brakes, and you've got about 15 seconds to decide what you're going to do. It is a narrow one-lane road. At the bottom of the hill is a one-lane bridge. There at the one-lane bridge is a bus picking up kids, and they've got the whole road blocked. You can't go straight, you don't have your brakes, and if you take a left or a right, you're going to go over a steep embankment into the stream. Now, John, I'm going to ask you a question. What are you going to do? He said, well, I'll tell you what, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to wake Jim up. He said, I told you Jim can't help you. He can't, you don't have time. He said, I know Jim can't help me, but I'm going to wake him up because Jim ain't never seen a wreck like we are fixing to have. <laughs> People are drawn to calamity. Let something happen that's out of the ordinary. It doesn't happen every day. Maybe in your life. Maybe in someone's life that you know. And when it happens, you know what everybody does? They naturally are going to look and see what's taking place. If there's an accident on the road, on the highway, how many can just drive by and not look at it? It's as if, I mean, you can't not look. I mean, you're going to look at it. You're going to see what's taking place. And sometimes I know this is bad. It's, it's as if this is big pile up uh, and, and you get up there and it's a little fender bender. And it's blocked traffic for like three miles. I'm thinking, really? I mean, it ought to have been more than that, you know, to block traffic for 20 minutes. I was expecting more than this. But people are drawn to calamity. We want to see. We want to look. We want to watch. Well, in our text tonight, we see that two uh, servants of God find themselves in the midst of a trial. And they have, as I've titled the message, they have a captive audience. And the whole premise of the message is this. Sometimes in life, uh, things fall out that we don't like, that we don't want, that we didn't expect, that we wish we didn't have to endure. But in those times, it gives us, just as Paul and Silas had in our text this evening, it gives us a captive audience. And so let's look at it this evening. Uh, the, number one, it was a trial for the servant. Now this trial was not expected. It was not expected. If we were to go back and read this chapter in its entirety, you know this text quite well. Here's what we would find. That Paul had a vision one night. And in the vision he saw a man of Macedonia saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. Now, Paul, naturally thinking, man, I mean, God's called us to go to Macedonia. There's a vision of a man. We better get there. And, and Silas joins in on the trip. And so Paul and Silas go. Now, I don't suspect that Paul laid it out for Silas like this. Now, Silas, we've got this mission trip, and I've seen this man in Macedonia. But let me tell you what's going to happen. We're going to go there, and we're not going to find this dude. Uh, we're not going to find this guy anywhere. In fact, all we're going to find is some women gathered for prayer by the river. Lydia, we're going to meet Lydia, we're going to win her to the Lord, and, and there's going to be some ladies praying there. There's going to be this young girl that has a spirit of divination. She's going to follow us around and vex us to the point that we're going to exercise the demon there, and, uh, and, and they're going to like what we do so well that they're going to bring us before the city, they're going to strip us of our clothes, they're going to beat us openly, they're going to put us into prison and put our feet fast in the stocks, and they're going to thrust us into the innermost part of the prison. Now, Silas, do you want to go with me? No. You know what he thought? Probably what we would think. God's called us to go into Macedonia and preach the gospel. It's going to be wonderful. But this trial was not expected. Beloved, think it not strange uh, as the, uh, concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. And what is it? If you're like me, you know what I think, Brother Simon, when I, I find myself in a trial? Wow, I sure wasn't expecting this to happen. I mean, this is strange. Uh, Lord, I'm doing what you asked me to do. Why is it that I find myself here? It wasn't expected. Life is full of unexpected events. 
In fact, the only thing you can come to know for sure is that you don't know anything for sure about what's going to happen. Just when you think you've got it figured out, just when you think things are finally in order, just when you think you're through that stretch of road and uh, like we were coming over here today, as a matter of fact, and, and, and we were in a traffic jam. We were in a traffic jam and, and BJ's like, it's green. We had the sat nav on and it's green or blue, whatever the, I think green was the good color and we saw so little of it. I'm not sure what the good color was, but I'm pretty sure it was green and we would jump in on the open road. Oh man, here we go. We're rolling down. Oh, two miles of that. And uh, there's another uh, construction site somewhere. And that's the way life is. You get cruising and you roll the windows down. You put the shades on. You let the sun come in. Oh man, traffic's backed up again. And so when, we, when those things happen in our life, what are we going to do? Christ said, these things I have spoken unto you, that you might have peace. In the world, you're going to, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Uh, Job said, <laughs> he was a real optimistic guy, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. But yet when we find ourselves in these times, we say, wow, I did not expect this to happen. And this was not expected in the life of Paul and Silas. Secondly, it was not warranted. What do I mean by that? They didn't deserve what happened. Sometimes we cause messes that we have to clean up. We ourselves make the mess. Maybe it's something that we do that we should not have done. A decision that we decide to make that we know we shouldn't have made the decision. And then sometimes there's something that we know we ought to do and we refuse to do it. We omit to do the thing that we know is right. And a mess uh, falls out because of our decisions. Well, guess what? When that happens and you make the mess and you handle it properly and correctly, well, I mean, that's just what you're supposed to do. If a child misbehaves, and you correct them and they take it well, they ought to take it well. They ought to own up to the fact that they did the wrong thing. But wait a minute, Paul and Silas did nothing wrong. What was their crime? All they did was preach the gospel. All they did was what the Lord told them to do. All they did was help a young lady. And no one had a problem with what they were doing until they saw that the money that they were making from this young lady was going to be taken away. And then they said, well, they're teaching laws and customs which are contrary to what we believe here. So it was not warranted. 1 Peter 2.20 What glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? What glory is it if when you do something wrong, and you suffer for it, you take it patiently. That's the question. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. And the question is this, okay, if, you, if you've done something wrong and you suffer and you take it well, is there any glory for God in that? There's not, according to this verse. But if you haven't done anything wrong, I mean, you know what I'm saying. You're living the best you can. You sin every day, but you're doing the very best you can. You're following the Lord the best you can. Uh, you're, you're praying and studying. You're witnessing when you get an opportunity. And you're giving and you're trusting God. And, and if something falls out in your life that you didn't expect. And you endure it patiently. And you handle it well. Now guess what? There's glory in that. That's what people say. Man, how does he handle that? How is he... How is he so strong in this trial? I wonder what it is that he has that I don't have. Church, you know, the world can act right when things are going well. Lost people can be on cloud nine when everything is going right in their life. When their family's great and their job's fine and their health is good. I mean, they're chipper people to be around. They're happy people to be around. But when something falls apart and the rug is pulled out from underneath them, then they don't have a place to turn and their joy and their happiness is gone. But it's a chance for us to separate ourselves from the world when those same things happen in our lives and yet we maintain the constancy of our joy and our happiness and our peace. And they say, wow, how, preacher, are you able to do that? It wasn't warranted. But it wasn't wasted. It wasn't wasted. You say, preacher, are you suggesting that this is something that we should run to? Absolutely not. No one with a brain is going to run to trouble, is going to run to trial. But I am suggesting this, that although we should not run to it, or I'm not asking you to run to it, but I'm asking you not to run from it. 
if you're going to have to do it anyway, you may as well make the most of it. If you're going to have to suffer, then don't waste the time in your life that you have to suffer when you could bring glory to God if you do it the right way. Now, if fretting and worrying and acting uh, uh, with, a, with a bad attitude would change it and take it away, then I'd say, go ahead, have a bad attitude. But it won't. We're still going to have to endure the trial. We're still going to have to go through whatever it is. It's not going to shorten itself because we decide to handle it the wrong way. It's still going to be there in our life. It, was, it will be an opportunity that will be missed and we will still live through it and suffer from it, and yet there's no glory in it for God. Years ago, I, I was working in a BF Goodrich Aerospace facility, and I had a guy, he wasn't my boss, but he was the boss of, a, of the department. His name was Kermit. Kermit told me, he, Kermit wasn't a safe man, but he was telling me years ago he was about to lose his farm. He and his wife, they had a, a large farm, and they were about to lose it. And at night, he would just lay down and go to sleep, and he was one of those guys that could just take his worries and his thoughts and frets and fears and just, you know, lay him to the side, throw his head on his pillow, and sleep like a baby. But his wife wasn't like that. She was up wondering and worrying, and she said, Kermit, how in the world can you just lay down and go to sleep knowing all the things that we have? He said, I'll tell you what, honey, so let's do this. He said, tonight, before we go to bed, let's take a, an assessment of everything that we own, all the land that we have, all the money we have in the bank, all the tractors and the equipment that we have. Let's write that down on the ledger. Then on the other side of the ledger, let's write down all of our debts, all the bills that we owe, the liabilities that we have, the people that we need to pay, the bank's uh, payments, whatever it is. Let's write that down on the ledger on this side. Then here's what we're going to do. You can stay up tonight and worry about it, and I'm going to sleep. And then in the morning, we're going to do the same thing again. He said, now, if it changes... If it changes in the morning because you stayed up and worried about it, he said, then tomorrow night I'll stay up with you. He said, but if it's the same in the morning as it was tonight when we go to bed, then I'm going to invite you to come to sleep with me tomorrow night and not worry about it because it's not going to change it anyway. It's not going to change it. So let's not waste the opportunity. Paul and Silas did not waste the opportunity. So we see a trial for the servant, and secondly, we see a testimony for the Savior. It was a scribe at an unusual hour. At midnight. At midnight. Now, you know what I want to do at midnight? I want to sleep. I sure don't want to have a prayer and praise service at midnight. And I, don't, I especially think that if I were put in prison for the wrong reason, when I did nothing wrong, and I was cast into the innermost part of the prison where people that murdered people were, and I was stripped of my clothes, and I was beaten, and my feet were fast in the stocks, and it was cold and damp and miserable, I would probably be saying, oh, Lord, I can't believe this. I mean, Lord, what have we done to be here? That's what I would have done. But that's not what Paul and Silas did. At midnight, they prayed. And sang praises. It was a testimony for the Savior. They had a captive audience. I mean those people. They couldn't go anywhere. And they heard the prayer. And praise service of Paul. And his buddy Silas. It was midnight. I, even sometimes when I'm. If I get sick. If I get ill. For me the worst part of the, of the day. Is those wee hours of the morning. Seemingly you feel better when. The, the sun's up and, the, and you can see the light outside but when it gets dark and you get in the wee hours of the night you're just wishing for the day to come when you don't feel well and you can't sleep but not these men they were praising God so it was described at an unusual hour Psalm 34 1 says I will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth 119.62 at midnight I will rise to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous Judgment, But his law, Psalm 1 and 2, uh, is, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate, the psalmist said, day and night. It was ascribed at an unusual hour. But it was accompanied by an uncommon power. This is a deadly match for the devil. Problems mixed with prayer and praise. It's a deadly match for the devil. He's got nothing for it. 
Because it gives us a platform. It gives us an audience. It gives us people that are peering into our lives to see how we're going to handle the situation. And they know themselves that they can't handle it this way because they've experienced some of these things. Maybe not exactly what we're dealing with, but there's some commonalities in all human suffering. And so they have experienced some of these things and they know how they felt. But when they look into our lives and they peer through the pain of of, of our windows, they can see something that's different. And the prisoner saw something something here that must have shook them. And we'll see in just a moment. It was, a, it was accompanied by uncommon power. Because the Bible says in verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. And the keeper of the prison, now verse 27, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. If you're like me, sometimes when you get into a trial, you're looking for the exit, the first way out, the quickest way out. This can't be God's will for me to be subject to this. There's got to be another way. There has to be a mistake. Uh, This is not the plan. This could be the plan. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do for God. I'm striving the best I can to serve Him fervently, prayerfully, daily. And yet I find myself in this. There's no way this could be it. And the first chance that I see a crack in the door, I'm going to run. But Paul wasn't looking for the exit. Sometimes we look for the exit, but God's looking for an example. See, if Paul were looking for the exit, you know what they would have done? They would have taken it. When the prison doors opened, had they been praying for God to remove them from the prison and help us, if they were praying that prayer, guess what they would have done? God's answered our prayer. We're going to leave the prison. But I don't find it so amazing, as amazing as it is, that Paul and Silas remain. What I find even more amazing than that is that everyone else remained. Because it it weren't just the bands of Paul and Silas that were loose. The Bible says that everyone's bands were loose. Paul in verse 28 cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Now why did the rest of the prisoners who knew not God stay? Well, I told you in the title of the message, because Paul and Silas had a captive audience. But you probably suppose that it was the bars and shackles and chains that captivated them. But no, it was not. It was the testimony of two men, Paul and Silas. It was their praise that they ascribed to the Lord. The songs that they sang, the joy that they had. And those prisoners thought, we've never seen anything like this before. What is different about these two men? And they were captivated. Now the the, the jailer, he'd fallen asleep. He wakes up. And he supposes, man, the, the doors are open, the chains have been loose. He, he, he supposes something that everyone would naturally assume, that everybody's gone. And what's he going to do? He's going to kill himself. He brings his sword to kill himself. And Paul, with a loud voice, says, sir, do thyself no harm, for we're all here. Now, Paul and Silas were looking for the exit, and they had taken it. When he went to draw his sword upon himself and thrust it upon himself, who would have cried out, do thyself no harm? You think any of the prisoners would have cried out? If Paul and Silas would have left out of the prison, what do you suppose everybody else would have done? They would have followed suit. If they were looking for the exit, that there's someone that got saved, and not just him, but his house. Imagine the change that was made in that one area because of this man who would take Paul and Silas to his own house and wash their stripes and clean their wounds. He and his family would come to trust the Lord as their Savior. And why? Simply because someone was willing to endure suffering. And their testimony was so strong in that time that it made a difference in the life of this jailer and changed the course of his family. And imagine the folks down the line from him that come to know the Lord, that at least got a chance to hear the gospel, who otherwise would not have. 
What about the prisoners who got to, got to hear the conversion of this Philippian jailer? They heard the question, what do we need to do to be saved? And they were given a clear answer. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. I can quite believe that there were a number of prisoners that trusted the Lord. We can, we don't know that for certain, but they heard the gospel. They saw the Philippian jailer accept it. It's quite possible that some of them trusted the Lord as their Savior. And what did they do? They just simply endured the trial. And that's what the Lord's asking us to do. To suffer patiently. I'm gonna, I've got about five minutes and I want to close with a story. Years ago, I was in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Preacher, I was headed down to see you guys. Autumn was, had an AU tournament in Nashville. You remember the time we come to Nashville for the AU tournament? Uh, we were up in Louisville visiting my wife's sister. And Louisville and Nashville was what? Five, six hours, four hours, something like that, would you imagine? Four hours. Now, we're leaving Louisville, and, and we, I want to get to Nashville. Now, ask me why I have to be in Nashville at any certain time, and I'll tell you, I didn't have to be there at any certain time. But when you set out on a trip, man, you want to get there. I mean, that's just the way it is. You want to get there. And naturally, I wanted to get there. We left. I didn't have to be there at any certain time, but I wanted to get to Nashville. I wanted to get off the road. And so we're traveling. We're coming down the interstate, dead stop traffic. I'm talking dead, not moving along at five miles an hour. I'm talking it was a parking lot on the interstate. Uh, people were pulling out barbecue grills and fixing steaks on it. That's a lie right there, but it was dead stop traffic. And I thought to myself, man, I've got to get, I've got to, get to Nashville. Now ask me why. No good reason, just because I wanted to get there. It was my plan to get there. Well, the traffic's three, three or four lanes of traffic, and there was a little left hand, there was a concrete barrier on the left. Now we drive on the, you know, the other side of the road from you guys here. Uh, and so we're over on this right hand side, and, uh, but in this left hand lane, th there's a narrow strip and there's three rows of cars, and there's a little narrow strip and a, and a concrete barrier, just enough to get a car in there. And I thought to myself, now if I could back over in there, you can't turn around, there's another room. But if I could back over in there and back up about a half a mile, I could turn and cross over the median, get on the other lane, and get out of this. And so I thought, boy, I'd like to do it, but man, if the police catch me, I'm gonna be in trouble. And, uh, but some, somebody, some idiot did it. And when that guy went by me backing up, I said, man, here we go. That's my cue. I jumped in and uh, I was, uh, you know, behind him. I was actually in front of him, but I was behind him. And uh, he, he leads the way. And then other people jumped in. And so there's a whole train of people that are backing up in this little narrow strip for about a half a mile. And then we get to the end of it. We get to the end of it. And then something occurred to me that hadn't occurred to me up to that point. What are you going to do now? Nashville's that way. Now you're going this way. And I thought, well, that is a real good question. I should have thought about that. Well, a little girl pulls up beside me in the car. Never saw her before. She says, uh, you know what? She said, you know where you, how are you going to get around this? And I said, I just had that thought. I don't have a clue what I'm going to do from here. She said, I'll take you around it if you want me to. I said, okay. That, that, that'll be wonderful. And, she, and so she starts driving. Now, I had a navigation system, but she took me on roads, no lie, that did not show up on the navigation system. I would have never made it around. Never made it around. And we come to a point, now, I wanted to get to Nashville. Why? It's because I wanted to get there. We come to a point, and uh, she says, now, I've got to go this way. And she says, if you take a left right here about two miles, you're going to pick up the interstate. You're going south. You're past the wreck. No worries. And the Lord says, I put her right there in your path. I put her right there in your path. But I wanted to get to Nashville. I don't know why. I just wanted to get there. See, God, I mean, he had a lady right there for me to talk to. But I, didn't, I wanted out. I was looking for the exit. And God was looking for an example. And she turned right. Now turn left. I can still see her face. I'll probably never see her again. I missed an opportunity. I can only hope that God sent somebody else to do what I wasn't willing to do because I wasn't willing to spend the time and endure just a little bit of a trial just for a little bit of a time to give her something that she needed because I wanted to get out. 
And I didn't want to be in it. And I wasted it. Maybe you're in a trial now. But if not, one's going to come. And God's going to be looking for an example. So don't be looking for the exit. Be looking for what he wants to do during the trial. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask you to bless it now. As we turn the service over to Brother Simon, we pray, God, you would speak to hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Preacher.